in order for things to get better or to move toward the good, which would be better, um, how do you convince people? How do you how do you make the case for the good in a society who's kind of seemingly in a very relativistic kind of postmodern? The good is whatever is the good. There's no objective good. How do you how do you translate your good, which I assume comes from your faith and your relationship through your faith over many years. How do you translate that to the, to the greater culture? Like what, what are some of the successes that you've had in convincing people that the good is the good and the true is the true? I think you need to really um, have conversations and like, like for me, for example, my own experience has shaped just how I've learned that, you know, what happens behind closed doors or what two adults do or one adult decides, it does have consequences for society and maybe for other people that you haven't thought about. I'm a trans widow, for example, so I share that story um, of how like people say, oh, well, how does that affect you if some guy wants to dress up as a woman or live his life as a woman? And, and it gets, you know, the bathroom issue gets talked about a lot, the sports issue gets talked about but you know, there's a much larger issue about men identifying as women. And there's a much larger issue about what children need. They have an absolute birthright to a mother and a father. And most of the adults who are advocating for, you know, against the natural family, they actually had a mother and a father. They had the benefit. The only privilege that exists in the United States besides being uh, you know, somewhat free is that is the privilege, the privileged group of people are the ones who've had a mother and father around their whole lives. And who uh, and the extra added bonus is if those two, if those parents, you know, did believe in a higher power that they were accountable to. So they, you know, they they stayed in some kind of a boundaries. Now, is that something that we can legislate? No, but we could, you know, have um, policies that are more pro family and as a individual share the experience. So what's good about um, two da- a, a mom and a dad in a, in a family? What's in it for the children and, and versus, you know, they're, they're missing out on one of those influences. And what, what happens when, when it's, you know, two moms or two dads versus um, the natural family. So you know, we need to be having those kind of ask my kids you know, ask my adult kids. Did it, did it affect them? Did it, did it have an effect on them that their father ghosted them to live as a woman? Uh, did it have an effect on them as children when they were uh, sent to court order therapy that told them they had to no longer call their father dad? Did that have an effect on them? And I think that you can imagine it did. So uh, you, Your ex-husband used the state to enforce his identity onto his children? Or did that's just how it shook out that's just how it rolled out um he absolutely was on the side at least initially of being um you know the the new pronouns being used and a new name um over the years that uh, the kids are able to advocate for some better boundaries there um, for themselves but initially the state did um come to his side and force my kids into therapy where they were coached on the pronoun usage why, in Texas. Why would the state do that? Why, why is that necessary for the state to insert itself into the child psychology? It's almost always um, happens. I don't think it's absolutely necessary in every case to involve a uh, you know, psychologist in a divorce. But in Texas, there almost always is court ordered therapy when there is a, um, a custody dispute. Okay. Uh, it certainly wasn't to benefit my kids. Okay. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. So I guess the way that it happened was that the divorce wasn't amicable and custody there was a battle over custody and so the state got involved through that custody battle and then assigned psychiatrist or psychologist who then came on board with the ideology the gender ideology in tow well it's not just a rogue uh, therapist it's the whole industry that and the whole uh, you know every institution even back you know 15 years or so ago was all on board with or afraid to confront that gender ideology. And so, and I would say in the case of the people that I dealt with at the time and my kids were dealing with, they were afraid to confront it. And they didn't have like, there is no, so the attitude is refer to the experts. 
Well, yeah. there were there were no real empirical studies. There were no yeah. systematic reviews of this stuff. And so my kids were the, um, you know, they're basically the guinea pigs of whether this worked. There was no expert to say, oh, uh, this is, you know, going to be really bad for the kids. But they're, you know, so there was no expert witness to bring because common sense is out and experts are in. There's a reason why an appeal to authority is called a logical fallacy. And, and that's an example of it right there. Yeah, but there's no expertise there because they're making it up as they go along. Right. Uh, I've, I've shied away from uh, the trans widow discussion because marriage is so messy. We're talking about a third person. It's hard to, it's hard to really ethically go into this, but it's just, it's so, I have so much curiosity. And so I just want to say that I want to be as careful as possible and respect you and the, the, the thir third person that we're talking about. Um, but I do want to ask you some questions if that's okay. Fine. Um, why was it important for him to not just be feminine? Why was it important for him to become a woman? And why was it important for him to have his children and you identify him with that identity? What, what was that? Why? My impression, because I've never got a solid answer for that from him, is that um, it was very important for him because he was told it was important. He was told that from the uh, therapeutic community, uh, the therapist that he went to. And um, yeah, he's a narcissist. And narcissists do, um, I mean, that's, that's my assertion that he is a narcissist. And from my experience of being married to him for 15 years and co-parenting for many years after that, so that he was a narcissist. And so there was an element of wanting to um, control things, to control me, you know, to never stop having some kind of effect on me, whether it's to upset me through the children or whatever. Yeah. You know, that as long as he could somehow manipulate me, he was getting a feedback. There's a feedback loop. It's very hard not to feed it. <laughs> As you know, I think most people know if they've been the victim of a narcissist, that you know, it's very hard not to react. And because that reaction totally makes them feel alive. Hmm. And so in, could it have been the case that the therapist not being able to treat the narcissism gave him uh, gave him the ability to exert it in a way that they could treat as something that they're treating his gender dysphoria rather than the, the root cause of it. Is that how it shook out? I think there was, um, in our case, and especially, and as it is with a lot of the, um, women, I was in a support group for women like myself, uh, at the time, uh, a lot of our husbands were really, it, it's not that they're confused about their gender. Um, this is like a cover story so they can get hormones. Um, this is what was really going on. If you, you know, talk to the women and, and know about their experiences, their husbands had a fetish. And this is something I wouldn't, you know, have a word for, you know, for over a decade later, I, I did encounter like a, a different word that's not used really. I think it's discouraged. It was called auto transphilia, but auto gynophilia. Yeah. Is it's a, a paraphilia where the the male is aroused by the idea of himself as being a female, and so I would say that's what was being um, you know experienced, and that the therapist did not even attempt. I mean, she's an activist therapist. She's written a book on how to transition kids. When oh. I went to the therapist with my ex, because I thought we were there to address the cross dressing, which was um, you know causing problems in our marriage. Um, and I thought that if this was hurting our marriage, that any rational therapist would say, well, if your goal is to save your marriage, don't do things that hurt your marriage. Uh, and it wasn't like he was cross-dressing his ass off in front of me or anything like that. It was stuff he would, you know, take my clothes or I'd, I'd find out that he had been cross-dressing. So when we went to address that, she told me I was a lesbian, uh, that I must be a lesbian because I had married a man who was... Um, <laughs> what year? What I, year was this? This was in 1998. Good God! This one, this therapist was ahead of the curve. She she must be on the bleeding edge of this. Goodness! How did you receive that 
the information that you are, in fact, a lesbian who's been making love with girl dick this whole time. I'm sorry. Dave. <laughs> well, I never even heard the term girl dick. I'm sorry. Way back then. But yeah. I, I didn't take it very well. I was I was really, really polite. Uh, just and I just said, if that is how he, you know, he feels and, um, you know, or, you know, that I was not a lesbian, of course. And she told me I was close minded because I wasn't open to all the cross dressing or allowing my husband to go out with other men dressed as women and have like girls night out. So I did not receive that well. I, I think we went to two total sessions, which is a miracle. We went to more than one. But it was because she had given me a book to read. It was called My Husband, Betty. And it was a, written by a lesbian who married a man. And then he decided that he wanted to um, dress up as a woman all the time. But that became very central to the relationship. So I read part of the book and then I put it down and said, this is all BS. And I'm not I'm not going to be, um, you know, like the lady in the book because their whole relationship became about, you know, really centered on this guy's um, fetish. And I don't even know if I knew the word fetish back then, to be honest, but you know, that that's what it was. And so my ex continued to see that therapist behind my back after that meeting for the next 11 years of our marriage. And she wrote him a letter so that he could get on hormones, which he did for 11 years of our marriage. I did not know about it. I definitely did notice some things but I just didn't know he was on hormones. So it did affect the intimacy, as you can imagine. Um, it, uh, we had four pregnancies, uh, but three children together had a miscarriage with cancer. Um, so I did notice that we didn't have much intimacy in the bedroom. Uh, and I now know because I got uh, the text messages between him and someone he met online where he admitted that he couldn't be intimate with me because of the hormones. And so if I would like raise the question like, hey, you know, how come we're not doing the married people things? Mm -hmm. um, then he would stop the hormones for a bit so that we could resume marital relations, to say it nicely. And um if he wanted to um, get me pregnant, then he would stop taking them. So because mm -hmm. it did affect fertility. So there's that. So I think it's just very unethical that doctors and therapists would do something like that behind the back of a spouse who was an interested party there. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, now in retrospect, um, I guess people are like, well, well, how could you have been so dumb? Well, this was in 1998, and all of this happened pre-Bruce Caitlin. So it wasn't like we were on Facebook and being bombarded with all this transgender stuff back yeah. then. Yeah, wow. Okay. And so, I mean, that's such a... I, I, betrayal is not even the right word, but that, that amount of deception going on for so long... Um, how did you process that when it came to light and how did it come to light? Came to light whenever I was, um, I had made a purchase. It was kind of a, you know, kind of a big purchase for me at the time. We usually would call each other and say, I'm going to spend a few hundred dollars and, you know, make sure it was okay. And at the, that time I didn't have a lot of money in the bank, but I had another account that I knew, knew had a few hundred dollars in it that I hadn't touched for a while. And so I couldn't get a hold of him that day. He was at work. So I made the purchase with the old account that had a few hundred dollars in it. And when I got home, I just checked on that account just to be double sure that nothing was going to um, bounce or whatever. And when I did, there were there was a new credit card associated with that account and uh, that I did not create. And uh, it was kind of interesting because we had paid off all of our credit cards and there were charges to Macy's and Victoria's Secrets. And so I knew this was going to be woman stuff. I suspected cross-dressing again, maybe another woman. And so I we shared an email address for, um, for our Boy Scouts. And it was his email, but I had the password because I used it for my Boy Scout group back then. And I checked in that for some reason around the same time. And they were messages to himself from some other email account. So I just 
logged into that email account. I, I was able to guess the password and uh, I saw the chat messages and that's where I found out that he had been uh, having an affair with someone online who was very in interested into the cross-dressing behavior and he was taking everything, all the secrets, that's where I read it. And um, I, I didn't process it. I was shocked, so I didn't process it. And uh, my family was in crisis after that for many years. And I would say that um, I really never processed it. It doesn't even feel like we're talking about me right now. Really? So, because I had to take care of my kids. So yeah. I can, you could never process something when you have to just survive it. So I just um, had to take care of my kids. Between the three children, there have been six suicide attempts um, at different levels of seriousness. And um, there's been, you know, one had to be put in the uh, mental hospital and one of them has OCD and trichotillomania and just, you know, issues ongoing because of the stress. And they were exposed by their dad to things they shouldn't have been. It, it's not this whole, like, we were like, oh, that's just your experience. No, there's a a problem, a larger problem of, ex of too much acceptance of all these behaviors and identities. So there's no scrutiny. And you know, my kids are being exposed to sex toys at their dad's house by and books about how transgender people have sex. And it wasn't their dad actually handing them all this stuff. It was in the environment and it was placed there by his transgender lover who was a female to male. Yeah. yeah. Female to male with a male to female. Okay. Um, who was walking around the house with her um, double mastectomy scars showing uh, to my kids and asking the kids to give her her testosterone injections. And this, this woman is a major activist in the uh in the transgender movement in, in in texas and and she threatened to kill my kids so i had to have a court order to keep her away from my kids i am um i'm blown away by the suffering of your family uh this is the other um ethical problem so like i don't want to like capitalize on on your suffering uh so i just honestly my sincere condolences. But the problem is that the institutions that are in place to protect the children, and everyone's a mandatory reporter in Texas. And the kids were going to a therapist this whole time and were relaying what was happening to them. And the, when I deposed the therapist, um, eventually, you know, with lawyers and under uh, oath, she said she did have a duty to report and she thought about reporting you know, for child abuse um, regarding uh, neglect and abuse. Um, and she didn't because she she said she felt the county, Harris County, uh, would not do anything. And that does not excuse. That is That does not excuse you from being a mandatory reporter. So that was disappointing. But, but I really felt that that wasn't the reason. I felt the reason is her career would have been at stake possibly had she made the report, you know, the whole LGBTQ would have came for her, you know, and in that institution, the family courts and in the uh, therapeutic community, she would have been, you know, frowned upon because she would have been going against uh, one of these identities, which is uh, you know, a, a protected class. You know, we're, we're not supposed to assume that um, it's bad for the kids, even when the facts are right in your face, um, that there's something going on. And we just, you just couldn't do it. You yeah. just couldn't do it. Just like you couldn't question Drag Queen Story Hour because these are the, these are the virtuous perverts. You cannot question their motives. You cannot question they're being around kids uh, as if it, it could cause them any harm. I just, I don't understand why a man would do this to his own children. Um, well, why do women do things? Why does anybody act selfishly? I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, selfish pursuit of, of uh, temporary pleasures instead of, 
you know, really wanting what's right in life, what's good, and that's your children. There's no greater blessing on earth than to have children. But we have a culture that tells us, you know, to have kids is to basically uh, risk your uh, prosperity. And it's just a lie. It's just a lie. Uh, everything that is good is being sold as not good. And everything that isn't good is being sold as uh, really good. So it, it is um, unfortunately just the times we're living in and I just, conservatives, if you want to conserve anything, you need to start uh, promoting what's good. And you said that you still haven't processed the series of events. Have, have you seen, um, or have you, have your children found therapies or, or doctors that have, or you know, professionals that have actually helped them? through this is is there a is there anybody out there that can help people in the situation that that your family's been in you have to be really careful in the therapeutic community i would say um but yeah there are some yeah. i mean you really want to go to someone who has the same goal as you um i I've, I've seen therapists but uh really the um goal in the last many years i guess 15 years has been to help my kids. And that's still the goal. They're, they're adults now, and that's still the goal. There hasn't been time to um, help them. I have uh, health complications that are um, directly related to the stress that I was under for many years. And, um, you know, my kids, you know, I just want them to not have that. I want them not to be in crisis mode and to unlearn, um, you know, the, the, living in trauma yeah. and uh, i i think that that's possible they've come a long way my oldest son uh, has got really great therapy in the last year or so and uh, my middle son um really his church he's um going to he's gotten some great counseling through that and it's matured him and helped him his faith has really helped him to um to see things differently and to heal. And so I still have one that is um, healing. You know, my my uh, youngest from that marriage, she is an adult and she's still in the process of working through all of that. Oh, I'm sorry to ask this. How is the impact of losing a father to, I guess, mom 2.0 affected the female in this, the daughter? Um, and I don't, not to get specific, I'm just wondering the psychological impact of losing a father to a trans identity has on a daughter. Just well, um, there are several things. Um, she does love her father and does have a relationship with him, but um, I think she has definitely experienced there is a manipulation going on, or that she is being used at times to validate him in a certain way or um you know to help be a a prop in the whole experience i mean he's told people that he gave birth to our kids and he pretends to be their mother the kids have had to play along with that to avoid embarrassing him and outing him so just um there's this whole complication of feeling like you're being dishonest and um, have helping someone, uh, you know, perpetrate a lie. And uh, she definitely has felt a loss where, you know, she didn't have a father around to do those things that other girls had a father around to do. And I, I, I think in my observation, and I, I did expect this, and I did try to mitigate this from happening, as that, you know, her relationship uh, relationships with males, you know, would, you know, be something to be concerned about. And as a mother, I always was. And she did have a, you know, a, a very uh, tragic um, first relationship with a male, um, which does happen uh, to a lot of females who don't have a, a trans identifying father. But um, 
just the willingness to put up with stuff that she shouldn't have was there and um, just some really abusive crap that she shouldn't have dealt with happened uh, in that. And and I was afraid that she would um, sell herself short, you know, and I still think that she has some things to work through in that regard and, uh, and, and really valuing herself because the message has been, and it comes out that, the self dialogue that the children have had, and I've heard this from my daughter, like my dad left me, you know, what does that say about me? That my dad basically chose dressing up as a woman over me. And that does hurt the kids when they think, you know, when they think like that and, and kids personalize things. And even though they shouldn't, and we work to try against that, when you're down on yourself, you have a really negative self dialogue and and they've they've experienced that and i think that's really um put my daughter at a disadvantage when it came to her dating life um presently i will say she is dating someone that i like <laughs> i think those speak approved. her well <laughs> yes mom approved um so you know but i still think that in her in her mind she has a ways to go and she has some things to process uh to make peace with with the past and and set the right boundaries in the future and i know she's working on that she's very good at setting boundaries with me by the way so <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know i'm dealing with the whole empty nest thing i almost i i just have one young one at home still and uh, my my kids from my first marriage are, are grown and um, my daughter's very independent she wanted to get out as soon as she could and yeah. i think she just doesn't like that you know, our rules, which are like not very many. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. I'm growing pants. So yeah. as a, as a woman, as a mother, um, facing trauma and then going into, I'm going to support my kids mode. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'll, you put yourself aside, you focus on your kids. How do you, what feeds you? Is it feeding other people that feeds you? Like how, how, what helps you? Does helping other people help you? Like what heals you? Is healing other people heal you? Like where, where, where have you found your strength over these years and, and, and your own healing? Um, well, I mean, in my faith, for sure, the healing and just knowing, like trying to be aware of any baggage that I brought forward um, from the marriage, you know, from being married to a narcissist, I would say, um, which is a more relatable experience. More people could relate to that than can relate to the whole um, man dressing up as a woman thing. Um, so just being mindful, like, okay, and what am I feeling right now? Am I feeling that because of what's happening right now? Or am I looking at it through the lens of what happened in the past um, so that I don't hurt my you know, current relationships? And, and recognizing that for um, a, a lot of things that happen within the family um, that they seem really, you know, we were in um, legal battles for years. And so everything was amplified because he sued for custody of the kids twice. So every little thing, wanting everything to be perfect. Um, so I had to relax off of that. Um, you know, everything does not have to be perfect. And I don't have to have a freak out session you know, because something isn't perfect. And um, it took some time to come out of the, um, you know, battle for my kids. Because yeah. really, I felt like if, if they weren't making A's, if there were behavioral problems, anything, that he was going to take the kids away from me. And that the courts, uh, being woke, were going to allow that to happen. So, um, Goodness. we were just, we were just stressed out. Yeah. And so just trying to, you know, live in the reality because anyone who's been with a narcissist knows that you get very gaslighted, you question reality. And I had this feeling for years after the divorce that he's going to do something to take my kids, you know, some, he's going to take my kids and they'll always be subjected to all the things that they were being subjected to, like being, he tried to put them in a pride parade with the BDSM leather daddy, you know, waving the whip, you know, um, I was like, um, and that was on their transgender float. And I had to, you know, argue and get that to be stopped. But I was very concerned. So for me, healing just, 
you know, trying to live in reality. And one yeah. of the things that I had to learn to do coming out of a marriage like that, where um, there was a lot of emotional, sexual, and financial abuse involved, I had to um, just learn that I have to trust what I see of my own eyes and not just go to uh, somebody who will tell me what I want to hear. And then in my case, it would have been my ex-husband, you know, just tell me what I want to hear. Tell me everything is okay. And um, so for that, those are the areas where I had to grow. My faith has definitely helped uh, anchor me. So, and I do, I do, um, it was really hard after all that happened because that was before the Bruce Caitlin thing and transgenderism becoming a household um, issue that people talk about. Yeah. Um, it was hard to watch the trajectory of the whole movement. You know, I would see a news report about, you know, the uh, a young drag queen or this transgender kid. And I was like, this is totally, you know, what we experienced. And I always say, if you want to know the trajectory of the transgender movement, ask a trans widow. Well, I'll tell you how it's going to affect your rights. They will tell you what you're allowed to think. When I went to court to um, for custody of my kids, I was questioned over if I could even co-parent because I'm a Christian and a conservative. You know, they every day fought with me over the use of pronouns. And this was in Texas in two thought like 2010. So, um, so the, before Bruce Caitlin. And, you know, so it's only worse now. They've only sharpened their teeth. So I'm telling you yeah. how it affected me will happen to all of society. And I'm watching on the news, you know, these things happening. And I'm seeing that more and more kids are going to be pulled into transgenderism. More and more p kids are going to lose a parent to this. And I would just cry and s because I just couldn't stand to think of more families being hurt. So it in a way, it is uh, therapeutic to uh, do what I'm doing and inform others that this this movement is harmful. And the best time to fight against it is before it affects your family. Because once it does, it's like your family members in a cult. And if you're speaking against it, you're ostracized. And all of society is now treating people who are speaking against this cult like they're some kind of pariah or some kind of hater. You know, you could lose your job. You know, your family members won't talk to you. I think we know the social consequences of speaking up, but we absolutely must speak up. I felt like I had to, and that does help. So in regards to, you know, is it healing? It's, it's healing to speak up. It's not something I want to do forever. Yeah. Um, it's not, I don't really enjoy activism. So, um, but yeah. it is something I think that at the time right now is necessary because trying to sit back and be quiet and watch this happen to other people, I just simply can't do that. You know, there's that, that phrase about the only pe person that you want in charge is the person that doesn't want to be in charge and the only person that you can trust being an activist is people who don't want to be an activist at all in, in a certain respect. So what, how are you speaking out? What, how are people, um, how can people contact, contact with you or witness your testimony, um, see your work, where, where's it out and what kind of things are you doing on the ground? So I'm the Texas director for mass resistance, which is an international pro family organization. And so you could reach out to me through Mass Resistance at massresistance.org. You can email me if you um, have something you want my advice or help on at tracy at massresistance.org. Um, you can uh, follow my blog at um, madmamabear.com. And... Um, you could sign up for the, if you're in Texas, you can sign up for the Mass Resistance Texas uh, newsletters, but you'll need to um, get vetted. You know, check. Do you guys huh? have background checks for your members? So we have really good um, um, security on our, um, on our system. And of course, we can do background checks. And then when we can't verify, um, they're not going to get to work with me. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are there events so, that you guys do, um, conferences or uh, rallies? I don't know. Yeah, Meetings, yeah, we have circles. rallies. And that's why getting um, signed up locally is important. Um, you can contact me at mass underscore TX on Twitter. And uh, you can look up 
you know, contact me at Tracy Shannon or Mad Mama Bear on Facebook. Uh, if you get in touch, um, once I confirm you're uh, safe, <laughs> we can work together. Yeah. Um, we really haven't had problems with that. Once the hate dies down, um, it, it dies down. And uh, we're mm-hmm. careful about who we work with. Can't screen everybody 100%. We might have somebody. It's a little different sometimes, but we've we've been pretty lucky in that regard. So. Yeah. Well, Tracy, thank you very much for speaking with me and uh, opening up your family's story to me. It's uh, really intense. Um, uh, so I am sorry that that happened to you. Um, but insofar as one can be glad for somebody to gain wisdom through hardship, I'm glad that you've gained wisdom through hardship. Thank you. And thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And...